Tennessee, known for Nashville, the Bell Witch, Wendigoon, and whatever took Dennis Martin. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the Lore Lodge. Every year, Father's Day weekend, the Martin family would go up to the Great Smoky Mountains and do a little camping trip. It was a way for everybody to get back to nature, spend some time together, and of course, you know, get away from home. In 1969, the Martin family was joined by the youngest member, Dennis. Now, Dennis was a perfectly normal little kid. He was a little bit behind in school due to some special needs issues, but for the most part, he was your average six-year-old, very playful, into the outdoors, liked to run around, and adored his older brother, Doug. Doug was nine. Clyde Martin, the grandfather, Bill, the father, and then Doug and Dennis, the two sons, decided that on June 13th, they would hike up most of the trail, spend the night in a cabin, and then on the 14th, on the morning, hike out to meet up with the rest of the family. For Doug and Dennis, this was not going to be a big deal. Both of them would hike with their father fairly often, and there was really no concern that Dennis wouldn't be able to keep up. So they just decided to go on their trip. When they reached the campsite, they would unite with some of Clyde's siblings and their younger members of their family, three of Clyde's brothers and one of his sisters. They started their hike at Cades Cove and took the Anthony Creek Trail up to Russell Field. Russell Field was a nice little area that was set up for camping, and they would spend the first night of the trip there. Speaking to investigators later, Bill would mention that they had seen a black bear and a couple of cubs, but that was about it in terms of wildlife. Now, the area is known for having a large number of predators, as well as venomous wildlife, but it's pretty commonly used by campers and hikers, so there weren't any bear attacks to be worried about. And for the most part, the other things you might run into would be coyotes and wild hogs. It, it wasn't like you were going up into an area with a rampant mountain lion problem, though bobcats are in the area. After spending the first night at a shelter in Russell Field, they would hike the short journey over to Spence Field early in the morning of June 14th. Upon their arrival in the early afternoon, Bill ran into some other adults who had children and suggested that the children all play together, which made complete sense for a group of six to nine-year-olds. Between 4 and 4.30 p.m., Doug got a bright idea. He decided that himself, Dennis, and a few of the other kids would surprise their parents. They were going to hide in the bushes off the side of the trail, and when their parents passed by, they were going to jump out and surprise them. Bill, of course, saw them do this, as parents tend to do with their children. I think when we're younger, we think that we've pulled the rug over on someone, when in reality our parents knew everything we were doing at all times, partially because they did the same stuff that we were doing when they were younger, and also because, let's be realistic, children are not really the most cognizant people in the world. So, when the kids went to go hide, Bill actually saw Dennis go behind a bush, and he wasn't super worried about it. Five minutes later, they decided, you know what, we're going to call all the kids into camp. Maybe it was time to eat. I'm not really sure. There's not a ton of details regarding this part of the journey. But Dennis did not appear. Doug and the other kids did. But Dennis was still behind the bush. Except when Bill went to investigate the bush, Dennis was not behind the bush. There was nobody else who had gone behind the bush. They had not seen any wild animals. Dennis was simply gone. So Bill's instincts kicked in and thinking there was only really one direction Dennis could have gone, he booked it down the trail for about two miles before determining there's no way Dennis beat me here. He must not be here. So he rallied everybody and they got together and they all searched the immediate area only to be met with the fact that Dennis was gone. So, they reported it to national park authorities, and the rangers themselves launched a search. It's important to note that the area in which they were camping, Spence Field, is marked by several steep slopes and ravines. There's also creeks, as well as numerous trails that go all over the mountain. So, while the area is treacherous, it's pretty well marked and well known. People know where things are there. Also in the area, as I mentioned, are bobcats, bears, wild hogs, as well as venomous spiders and snakes. So by no means are you in a very safe area, but so long as you're being smart, you should be fine. Of course, a six-year-old can only be so smart. For example, one of the snakes common to the area is the copperhead. Now, I personally have a story about copperheads, because when I was in Boy Scout camp, when I was about 12 years old, we were staying at Camp Horseshoe, which is down on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland. And it's not true camping. You're not in tents. You're in these little bungalows. And part of the problem was that those only had one wall. There were canvas flaps that went down the sides, and then the front was open. So wildlife could pretty easily get in. 
And that's exactly what happened to one poor kid who was not in our troop, but wanted to stay a second week and got placed with us. He woke up to see something that looked very much like a copperhead snake laying on his stomach. The group of us, mostly the older boys, managed to wrangle the snake into a sleeping bag container, because, you know, your sleeping bag comes in another bag, it's a bag exception and whatnot, um, and take it up to the nature center, where we were told that it was in fact not a copperhead, it was just a snake that looks like a copperhead, but is completely uh, not a problem, totally safe. I mean, it could bite you, but it wasn't going to poison you, so not a big deal. Anyway, it was pretty traumatic for that kid, I hope he's doing alright. Now, the search was launched pretty early in the evening, and you've got to remember that, you know, launching a search around 7.30, 8.30, you're not going to have a ton of daylight, but it is still light out, and you still can search. It's summer, so it's nice and warm. But there was a caveat, which was that that night, a torrential downpour dropped over three inches of rain on the mountain and obscured basically any tracks and made it very difficult for dogs to pick up a scent. So they also couldn't really search that night because everyone was getting soaked and visibility was terrible. Following this, there was a lot of mist on the mountain the next day, the next few days really, which obscured search efforts from the air. Furthermore, while it was summer and in this region of the United States, it can get up to 80 to 90 degrees in the middle of the day in June, there was a bit of a problem. Now it was June, which means that the temperatures can get up to the 80s and 90s, and often do, and at night usually only dip down to the 70s. As a result, Dennis was wearing just a t-shirt and shorts, and for shoes, it's a little uncertain. I've read reports that he was wearing loafers, which doesn't make any sense at all, and I've also read reports that he was wearing tennis shoes, which makes a lot more sense. So, for a normal Tennessee night, this wouldn't have been a problem. In nearby Louisville, Tennessee, it was 70 degrees that night, which is totally normal and fine and warm, and that's the kind of thing that you can deal with. However, in the mountains, it got down to around 50 degrees, and with that torrential downpour, it's very likely that Dennis was soaking wet. They were not able to find him the first night, the night of the 14th, and in the morning they launched a much more organized search. They had everyone meet at the bottom of Mount Boat, that Sunday, the 15th of June, around 250 searchers were involved at the direction of rangers all throughout the area where Dennis initially went missing. In fact, there were so many volunteers that the Park Service claims that they had to shut down the access roads to prevent people from muddying up the search, which could be possible. By Monday, the Red Cross was involved, as well as a set of helicopters provided by a man named Tony Stark. I am not making this up. Yes, really. There was a man named Tony Stark who acquired the helicopters for them. I, I was sitting there reading the National Park Service report on the case, and I myself was stunned. Of course, due to the heavy rainfall, dogs were having trouble picking up the scent, the ground was wet and mushy and difficult to navigate, and searchers in general were having problems with getting cars and trucks up the access road to even deliver supplies or more volunteers. As well, due to the fact that this was in a national park and an area of the park that straddled the Tennessee-North Carolina border, the FBI got involved because this is actually one of the few times that the FBI does investigate kidnappings. Which, of course, is what they were investigating. To them, that made the most sense. So there's no way Dennis wandered off that far on his own. Somebody, or something, must have grabbed him and taken him somewhere. And they must have done it very discreetly because Bill was watching that bush the entire time. He said he took his eyes off of it for maybe a few seconds. There's no way that Dennis just vanished like that, and it seems very unlikely that anybody would be able to grab him. Now, he wasn't the most verbal kid in the world because he was a little bit behind, but he certainly wasn't the type to just be completely silent if somebody grabbed him. Somebody would have to sneak up, grab him, prevent him from calling out, and then make off with him, all without his father being able to see what happened. That said, they still did search for other possibilities, such as Dennis being hidden somewhere in the park, or the more grisly possibility that he was murdered and disposed of. One of the options for that was that his body had been dumped into any of the park's many latrines. Now, if you don't know what a latrine is, uh, it's basically, if, if you just take a, the, the actual, like, bowl of a toilet, and, and no, nothing else, just the bowl and the seat, and structure it over a, a large hole in the ground. It's basically a, a porta potty, but in a very natural sense. The rangers had to make sure that Dennis's body wasn't in any of those, which meant putting on uh, chest high waders and being lowered into vats of human waste. So, to those rangers, 
A few days into the search on June 17th, some tracks were found near an area called Eagle Creek. Now that's about a mile south of Spence Field where Dennis initially went missing. And those footprints, one of them was a bare foot and the other appeared to be a tennis shoe, one that could possibly match Dennis. Now, the investigators who got here claim, it is alleged in the report from uh, the National Park Service, that Mr. Martin said that the footprints were too big to be Dennis's. So they chalked it up to being those of a Boy Scout from a nearby troop that was camping and it got involved helping out the search. The problem was, none of the Boy Scouts were missing any shoes, and Boy Scouts always travel in at least groups of two. So the likelihood that it was a Boy Scout seems very low, and the reason for the dismissal that these could have been Dennis's prints is really flimsy, because they were child-sized footprints. Now, without Dennis's shoes to actually check, is it possible that they just made an error? Sure, they did do a plaster cast of the footprints, and that's how they determined it wouldn't work, but I'm not, I, I couldn't find any evidence that Bill ever actually said that. The only report was from the National Park Service that, oh, well, Mr. Martin said that those weren't his footprints, which I personally find a little bit suspicious because who else's footprints would they be? They led into the creek and then disappeared from that point. There was no following them to the other side. They just seemed to end. Another point that makes the Dennis Martin case so interesting is the military involvement. Now, the National Guard got involved in a very normal way. They were just a part of the search. That's what the National Guard does in cases like this. What isn't typical is the involvement of U.S. Army Special Forces. Now, U.S. Army Special Forces, the Green Berets, at the time, did absolutely train in and around Great Smoky Mountain National Park. But there were 40 of them called in who were not training. They were not there on assignment, they were just in their barracks at Fort Bragg. It is possible that they were training in the area and that it was just classified, or that it wasn't properly reported, but the important part is here, they, they weren't just there, they got called in. Now, if you don't know what the Green Berets or Army Special Forces are, pretty simple. They were founded in 1952 as a new branch of the U.S. military, and the goal was to practice unconventional warfare and asymmetrical warfare, various ways of entering combat that were not conventional, that were not the typical two lines of soldiers, whether they be in actual battle lines or just set up across a front. Instead, they would go behind enemy territory, they would train insurgents, they would do uh, undercover missions, things like that, and they were, at the time, a fairly new piece of the Army. They weren't formally incorporated as U.S. Army Special Forces until the 1980s. Now, they serve nine primary missions, but the three that are really relevant to this are Special Reconnaissance, Direct Action, and Foreign Internal Defense. Now, Foreign Internal Defense is, is kind of iffy on this one, because, you know, is, is that really the same thing as fighting Bigfoot? No, but you get the point. You get why I said that. What I'm essentially saying here is, if anyone were going to be hunting something out of the ordinary in a national forest or park, the Green Berets would be who you'd call. In this case, there were 40 initially called to serve in this search, and you know where they were sent? On June 17th, they were deployed to Eagle Creek, the exact place that the National Park Service had said they didn't think Dennis was just that day. And of course, the next morning, after the initial search of the Eagle Creek area, they called in another 20 Special Forces members. And the next morning, after searching the Eagle Creek area for Dennis, they called in more of them. Which, to me, does not scream dead end. It screams, this is not something the National Park Service is capable of handling. Also established on the 18th was an entirely separate communications channel for the Green Berets. Now, it is possible that because they're a military special forces group, they were keeping them separate just because it was what made the most sense. But at the same time, it doesn't make much sense to have your search groups not involved with each other, especially the search group that has the most training and resources available to them. You would think that the Green Berets would be communicating with the National Park Service and Search and Rescue, but non-government search and rescue, non-federal or state government search and rescue forces, kind of appear to have claimed that the, the National Guard was communicating with them, but the Green Berets weren't, and that the Green Berets were not actually part of the search and rescue mission, or at least if they were, they weren't helping by communicating. They were off doing their own thing, which leads to some questions. 
So, while the National Guard was searching the Eagle Creek area, where Dennis Martin, according to the National Park Service, absolutely was not, the National Park Service was following up on other very, very important leads, and the Special Forces group were actually helping with it. What were those very important leads? Well, uh, a psychic in Michigan, uh, Mrs. Schwaller, called in a tip predicting where Dennis would be found, and for some reason, Army Special Forces took it seriously. Now, they didn't actually find anything, or if they did, they didn't report anything, but I just find it odd that some of America's most highly trained soldiers bothered to follow up on a tip from a psychic in Michigan. Now, of course, nothing was reportedly found as a result of that tip. That doesn't necessarily mean nothing was found, because if there's one thing the government doesn't do, it's tell the truth. Also interestingly about the Special Forces group, I, there were a total of 71 of them at their, their peak involvement. After the 22nd of June, none of their movements, none of their operations, none of their findings are actually reported in the National Park Service report. It's just, they're there, and then on the 22nd, we're told what they're doing. We're not told what they do the 23rd or the 24th, and then we're told that they left on the 25th. And like I said, at no point does it appear that the Special Forces group was actually working in tandem with Search and Rescue. They seem to have been on their own operation. Now again, that could be nothing. It could also not be nothing. I will say that part of what's made me skeptical about the Special Forces involvement is the way that certain Special Forces operators have talked about this case and how odd the behavior of the Green Berets was. Of course, the fact that they were there isn't odd. It's the way they seem to have gone about this. I won't name names, but I've, I've got questions. Of course, there was nothing reportedly found by the National Park Service, by the Army, or by Search and Rescue, and on June 29th, due to a lack of resources and honestly just a lack of any headway on the case, the search was disbanded. Now. Uh, Mr. Martin, Bill Martin, put up a $5,000 reward equivalent to about $36,000 in today's money for any information that led to the finding of his son, but nothing was ever found. Another group of hikers reported that on the day that Dennis went missing, around the same time he went missing, they had seen something very odd. They had seen what appeared to be a bear running on two legs with something slung over its shoulder, perhaps a child, but at the same time, this was reported several days later, and it's entirely possible their memory was playing tricks on them. It's also possible their memory wasn't playing tricks on them. And, you know, I'm, in the absence of any evidence to the contrary, I'm inclined to believe that maybe they did see something weird, and even if it wasn't something supernatural, it's possible that it was some sort of wild man out in the woods. We know those are real, and while it's not really a culture of feral people that are out there or any sort of, you know, common thing, there are people who, for some reason or another, choose to go off the grid into the woods and are never really seen again by society, but they live. After the Civil War, a number of people traveling west to settle California ran into a Confederate Civil War veteran just living out alone in the woods who according to them, had lost a lot of the trappings of civilization. So, is it possible that there are wild people living out in the Appalachian Mountains? Appalachian, sorry, Wendigoon, I know, I'm not a fed. But is it possible that there are people living out in the Appalachians? Y yeah, there's another story of a woman who was chased by someone or something through the Appalachians that we'll cover at some point. Uh, currently, you can find that on Mr. Bolland's channel. I can't totally remember the name of the video. But... At the end of the day, it's just very strange. Dennis was never found. Uh, years later, somebody found remains, uh, but didn't report it until 1985 because he was worried that he would be uh, prosecuted for... He was hunting for ginseng, which I guess is not legal in Tennessee. So he didn't report the bones he found because he was worried about being prosecuted for a plant. That sounds familiar. Maybe we shouldn't prosecute people for plants. It just seems like a waste of resources, if I'm being honest. Anyway, until we get a chance to actually go down there ourselves and take a look at the area, speak to the locals, and hopefully find somebody who was involved in the search, or at least knows somebody involved in the search, we can't come to a ton of conclusions here. I do think the possibility of something supernatural is very real, 
and I would not be surprised. I also think that the possibility of a kidnapping is very real. So there are both mundane and paranormal explanations for this. The mundane one has a lot more holes than the paranormal one, but at the same time, the paranormal one is paranormal. So I'm torn on this one. What definitely does confuse me is the fact that nothing was ever found, and the only clue, the only real piece of evidence was so quickly dismissed by the National Park Service, only to be the immediate center of investigation for special forces the next day. So there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of holes that may be the result of a government cover-up. We may never know. But I'm curious to know what you guys think, so please let us know in the comments. We love to hear your theories. And if you want to support what we do here at the Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to our Patreon for just $1 a month. That $1 goes much further than you might think it does, and it helps us keep all of this running. If you're new to the channel, thank you so much for watching. If you're a returning viewer, also thank you for watching. Um, I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge.